What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to today's video where I'm going to show you how to fix your third generation Camaro or Firebird power antenna for around $1.50. This is a very common issue you're going to find on many cars where the power antenna motor will run up and down but nothing will happen. This antenna mast, as it's referred to, doesn't travel up and down like it's supposed to. Now what happens inside of the power antenna motor most commonly happens if you can hear your motor running both ways is that there's a nylon cord inside of there and what it does over time is that it breaks and the function of that cord is that it pulls and pushes the antenna up and down. Now to find a replacement power antenna unit from a junkyard is going to cost you right around a couple hundred bucks unless you find a deal on one but pricing them out a little bit if you can even find one that works you're going to spend quite a bit of money on them. I'm not aware that you can buy a reproduction one or a rebuilt one. I'm not even sure that you can buy a mast rebuild kit anymore either. So this is pretty much limiting your options when this stuff happens. You can always install what would be a fixed antenna like I have on the Camaro like this. But if you're like me and you're kind of a DIYer, you're gonna find a way to rebuild this yourself. And after doing some homework online, I found a way to rebuild your power antenna for right around $1.50. Now, when I bought the car, my power antenna didn't work at all. The radio works and everything, but reception was kind of hit or miss. As you can see now, that thing works great. Travels just fine both ways. And actually, the fix for this is a little bit of braided steel wire from Home Depot. So, I don't want to drag on and on about this. I'll explain more as the video goes on, but let's hop right into it. I gotta get the car up in the air on the front, get the wheel out, peel the fender liner out, and what we're actually gonna find is a giant mouse nest also. So I'm filming this after being done with everything, but I wasn't quite sure it was all gonna be all in this video like most of them, so I'm kind of filming this after the fact. But the big thing is that we're gonna get most of the mouse nest out of this car that's still hidden way deep in the lower dash area in the firewall part of the engine or forward of the firewall. But the two biggest things that are going to get done in this video is that we're going to demouse the car even more because believe it or not, there's an even bigger mouse nest in there, or there was as of a couple days ago. And when I went to drive it, the smell was just putrid. So I think at this point I've got 90% of the mouse out of the car. I got a little bit of a smell yet, but it's not nearly like it was. One other thing you might notice down there is this white rag and what's happening now that I just noticed is that my heater core is leaking. So that's awesome and life continues to rip, but um, yeah, so far it's becoming a good driver. Enough of me rambling on, let's hop right into today's video. All right, so I was driving the GTA tonight and it's a little bit warmer out and the smell of mice was unbearable. So the warmer it gets, the more odorous it is and I couldn't quite tell where it was coming from, but I assumed it's got to be inside of the HVAC here somewhere. Now, I don't know how they got in, but I started inspecting around here just a little bit. And you will see some mouse droppings right there, which led me to think, okay, maybe they were inside of this housing. See, way down in there, there is a nice little mouse nest. What I need to do is get access to that get my vacuum cleaner in there and clean it out as good as I possibly can because I think that's where most of my smell is coming from. Whether it's just in there or also inside of the blower motor housing area. It's probably in both. It probably went all over in there. So I gotta take this top lid off. I'm gonna pull the blower motor out. I'm just gonna try and clean it out as good as I can. Try and make it sanitary and hopefully it's gonna quit fogging up inside of the car when I have the heat on because there's some humidity in there and it will more importantly, stop smelling like mouse piss because it is disgusting now. So, this isn't the most fun task, but what I'm gonna do is just take everything apart real quick. We'll go to a little time lapse and hopefully we'll be set up to do some vacuum cleaning. So this is what my air conditioning condenser looks like or whatever this thing's called. Look at that. There may be a mouse in there. I can't really tell, but I wish you guys could smell this. It's uh, pretty horrific. I think I lucked out. They didn't get onto the car side of that air exchanger, 
But what I do have is a heck of a mess in there and I gotta clean it and do some sanitization and hopefully that's gonna take care of my smell. There was nothing on this side where the uh, door flapper is. There was nothing in there. So anything that got in there, there might be a little, like a couple pieces of particulate that are in there, but it doesn't appear that mice made it into the car. It just seems like all my smell was coming from in here and it is disgusting. So somehow or another they got in there. Must have been through the foam insulation. I think this is going to take care of my problem after I vacuum all this out. I'm going to blow this condenser out really good with shop air and uh, hopefully sanitize it somehow. I probably put a text sanitation in it earlier, but the air conditioning system does not work in the car and it was actually dry when I opened it up, so there, I didn't actually let anything out into the atmosphere. I did check with the little Schrader valve and nothing came out, so I didn't just dump it all out into the atmosphere. The air conditioning system doesn't work anyways, so... At the end of the day, this is going to clean up and hopefully it's going to smell 10,000 times better in the car because tonight when I was driving it, it was just unbearable. I hated it. So, call this a win. So after a lot of cleaning, what I have is a very clean HVAC assembly. So what I'm going to do is put this back together. I cleaned everything I could out of here. I even took a little bit of shop air and uh, blew out everything I possibly could. So I feel pretty good about it overall. Everything's out of that duct door assembly over there. Uh, should be pretty good to go. I sprayed it with interior cleaner, a little bit of disinfectant spray, and... Even just walking in the garage after a couple hours, it smells a lot better in here. So I think I took care of the majority of the problem. Not to say that there's not more mouse hidden around here, but for now I took a pretty good dent into it. Alright, so I got this little thing I've used for Meguiar's before. It's basically like a, uh, it's like a new car scent. And what you do, not that the air conditioning works in the car, but you set your air conditioning on high, on max or whatever, so it actually recirculates. What you're gonna do, take this sucker right here, set it in the middle of the car, fire it off and shut the doors, let it run for 15 minutes. So just like this, let it run. So basically what it's doing while running is it's going to recirculate all that air through all the vents and hopefully we're going to have a little bit better smelling car when it's all done because that cleaning product I sprayed in there is like lavender scented and it's not really that great. So I'm going to let it run for 15 minutes here then pretty much just going to leave the doors open and everything and let it air out. I've done it in a couple of vehicles before and it does last for, I don't know, a few weeks. Hopefully that will carry it past the point of smelling like I just cleaned it and take care of the rest of that mousy smell. Alright, so as suspected, just more mouse action up in there, which is great. Get that vacuumed out real quick and sanitized. Uh, the back of the fenders looks really clean. Sometimes moisture and stuff sits back there. But in my case, it's super clean. So that's in good shape. I'll just wash it down a little bit while I'm in there. It looks like this motor might be pretty easy to replace uh, if I end up doing the whole thing. But inside, the previous owner did cut those three leads here. There's the three wires for, for the power antenna motor. 
we did cut them. So luckily it looks like I got enough to work with, which is good. And should be able to spice those up, get this thing back and running pretty quick. So I'm pretty much done up in there. I got my phone up into that corner. I could actually see that all of the nest in there is gone now. And I believe that part must go behind the firewall and up into that heater box. So I actually emptied this garbage can out last night. Look at how much nest was in there. There's probably a pound or two of nesting material. Just mice are the worst things on the planet. So that's probably where that little bit of smell was still coming from. That was all pretty dry. It came out really easy and that would explain why I wasn't really smelling it in the car. But uh, even driving a little bit this morning after cleaning out everything earlier in the video, I could still smell it a little bit and I think that was the rest of it. Okay, so after doing a whole bunch of homework because I was starting to get no results at all after hooking everything up here, what I found is that our genius here decided to cut them flush with the inside of the body plug here. So you can see, I butt splice them, assuming that they continue into the car to the power antenna relay, and they don't. They were just that long. So thank God this guy took care of this one for me. It, they actually like started decommissioning the whole power antenna system. This is your power antenna relay, and there's a power up and power down out of it. Ground is your dark green wire. What they did for me, which was pretty cool, is cut it really short and uh, yeah, he cut it inside the car and outside of the car and he took care of a nice little shrink job for me so it wouldn't actually cause a problem. Now, I think something's gonna happen when I hook it up. Whether or not the antenna is good is a whole nother story, or uh, the antenna motor rather. When you hold the relay, you can feel it click in your hand going up and it clicks going down. So I think this is gonna work. But what I need to do is get everything spliced back up and fished back over. I mean, where this thing sits, there's not even enough cable to get over there. So he took out like a foot of cable. I mean, I don't know. Some people just shouldn't have tools. So I'm gonna run three new leads out there. It really sucks that I've got to do this, but it is what it is. And I guess we're gonna find out shortly whether or not the antenna is gonna work. So I'll get to that and I'll catch up with you guys when I'm done. Okay, so we got a lot of sound and no action. So. This is why they actually did this. It sounds like the motor's just running and running and running like it's trying to shut, but it's not actually bottom mount. So the motor in there is probably stripped or whatever. You can see I did a really good job temping it. Uh, I just wanted to see if it worked. I wasn't gonna butt splice everything again, just to find out that in fact it doesn't work, which would obviously, it's probably not gonna, being they did this, so. Anyways, that's what's going on, and now I know for sure that I'm gonna pull out that motor and antenna assembly. It should come out pretty easy by the looks of it and maybe we can temp it back up and just see if it's gonna work for us. It does change state. You hear the motor switch there? But nothing happens, it doesn't go up or down, it just makes some grindy plasticky noises. So listen to it when I turn it off. So our up and down command works, which is good. And Instead of taking out all of that wire, our owner could have done this. But, you know, sometimes you gotta make the job harder for the next guy, so who knows? Maybe he had that kind of going on in his head. Maybe he was just uh, a little upset with the car and decided to take it out on me. Okay, so I went to the parts store after they said that they had one, and what they had was pretty much the same thing that this is, and it just isn't gonna work. So. The RF connection is way different. Uh, the mast is way too short to fit. There's nowhere to mount the motor, nothing like that. So this is basically junk to me, and that's what they had locally. After doing a little bit of digging online, it looks like at third gen ranch, I can get a mast assembly rebuild kit, which is essentially this gold tube, the antenna that's inside of this, the silver antenna, and it has a new nylon cord, which is wrapped around this gear that spins the motor, and that's what pushes it up and down. So mine runs up and down, but it doesn't move, which tells me that the cord is broken, which is what happens to 99% of these. So what I need to do is either get a new motor from somebody online or a new mast or whatever it may be, but that's about all I've got on it for now. I'm kind of struck out on it. Uh, it's not a real common thing. You can't really just get a rebuild kit from like GM Parts Direct anymore. I guess it used to be like 20 bucks, they're pretty cheap, but I'm having no luck finding it. So 
So I've got to do some more homework on this and I'll take you guys along for the ride on getting this thing working. But for now, I'm gonna clean up my mess and I guess I'm gonna see what develops. Okay, so I should be really clear about this first, is that this, like many other things on these cars, this is not my idea. I found this method online, and it's actually from a different website, it's not from thirdgen.org. I found it just kind of cruising the internet looking for a way to repair these or whatever, but as you'll notice when you go to take yours apart, the antenna tip right here, a big nut on it. So this does come off, it's threaded. It didn't say that in the article, but I started monkeying with it. And what you're gonna find is that when you take it, you push it all the way back in, like so, on this end. You see the nylon cord come out. What you're gonna do is go shoop, pull that all the way out, and this is where we're gonna make our repair. So I'm gonna melt that nylon cord out, and what I'm gonna do is take the correct size braided wire and solder it in there, or you can epoxy it. The guy that originally did this said that he welded his into place, but I probably won't do that because that'll be a little bit more labor intensive. Um, Regardless, I'm gonna burn this out with a butane torch real quick and I'll show you guys what I'm left with. But hopefully, out of the three types of cable that I bought, I'm gonna have one that's perfect for it. Uh, overall, I think this is gonna be a pretty good repair and it should be bulletproof if you get it soldered in really good. And that took all of one second to melt out. So if I can slip this in there after cleaning it a little bit, solder it, this is gonna be good to go and super tough. Like I said before, if you were to get a replacement one from a junkyard or whatever, it's probably not far off from the same shape. They all seem to break this way. So that nylon cord is still in here as well. Um, I haven't actually picked it out yet, but I'll show you, here's the rest of it. It's all spooled up, so that was in the pulled down position. I do have a length measurement that I'm gonna go for. It's like 36 and a half inches if I recall. So I'll do that and when we're in the car, we'll fully retract it and everything and then hopefully when we fire up the motor by turning the radio on, it's gonna shoot that antenna up and we'll have a good up and down action. It was recommended to buy a 332nd gauge wire and there was some talk back and forth on the thread that I was reading about whether or not you could use an insulated wire like a PVC or nylon insulated one. These are the same wire gauge, they're 332nd, uh, wire rope, I guess you'd call it. On the left is insulated, on the right is not. So the difference is, you know, one being insulated versus one, to, one is not. Inside of it, they're the same gauge. What I found, when I took the insulated one, it lays just about perfect in there. So what it's not gonna do is be able to walk up and over itself. It's gonna have to lay down nice in there and spool itself in and out. The factory nylon wire, it fits in there very, very snug inside of that channel so it can't cross itself up. I found that the nylon insulated wire is probably gonna be the better call, so I'm just about to mock it back up and see if it's gonna pull this thing up and down. If it does, I'll let you guys know, and uh, we should know pretty quick here. Okay, so quick update. I had the thing installed in the car, uh, just in the passenger seat, and I turned the radio power on and off with a jumpered, and it was a little bit snug. You could sense that there was some drag on the motor. So I actually opened up the hole that this grommet is on just a little bit so it slides on that rope really, really perfect. Because before it was a little snug, it was actually noticeable. If you have your motor apart, it's a little grommet that sits in here that actually feeds out of the spool up into the antenna mast. So otherwise, I'm pretty much ready to put some dielectric grease on the motor housing and the gears and everything. And we're going to make sure that this thing's all sealed up. I'll put a little bit of RTV all around the top of it. There didn't seem to be much, if any, along the bottom. Uh, maybe they were planning on some drainage so you do get some moisture in there for whatever reason, from rain or washing the car or whatever. It'll have a chance to drain out of the bottom. So pretty much just gonna put a little bit of black RTV through here. I'll be sort of generous with dielectric grease in there, uh, just enough to keep things lubricated and moving nice and easy. And maybe I can even figure out a way to lubricate this cable a little bit so it can move 
up and down the antenna mast real easy. So the smoother this thing runs, the better it is because the easier that's going to be on parts. But like many things, you can overdo it. So I wouldn't pack it like you're doing a wheel bearing or anything crazy. But I'm going to go ahead and put this back together and I'll show you how it works in the car. So we got everything all mocked up in the car right now. The antenna is obviously down or uh, withdrawn. But what I'm gonna do is fire it up. By turning on the key, that antenna should go to its full extension. Well, look at that. Works awesome. If I shut the key off, Appears we now have a working power antenna. So that's how you do it. With a little bit of creativity and doing some homework, you can get this working for right around $1.50. That's what I actually paid, minus my time, obviously. The previous owner hand cut those wires short and I didn't get impatient and just pull them all out or whatever. I probably could have saved it, but that's neither here nor there. This is working really good, so I'm gonna try and button this up tonight and hopefully tomorrow we can go for a little bit of a drive and see what we got. There you have it, the antenna works perfect. I would think it'll be a long-term fix, but I'll let you guys know more in the future. If that thing breaks or anything, the reception is perfect. So some of you may comment that they used a nylon rod to push that antenna mast up and down because it's not conductive. And for some reason it may cause interference being I now have a conductive push and pull rod. That does not seem to be the case. So. Let me know what you guys think. So let me know what you guys think. Looks like you have to buy a little bit of material for it. You just need a soldering gun or a uh, propane torch and some solder and you should be able to do this yourself. All right, so the fender well is all back together. I did replace a couple of pieces of missing hardware in here on the inner, of the, on the inner edge of the fender liner and as well as a couple of the body plugs or uh, body darts or whatever you might call them. Before I go ahead and put the wheel together, the outside of the wheel is really nice, but the inside of the barrel is really, really dirty. So I'm gonna go clean this up real quick with my hose and a little bit of all-purpose cleaner and a scrub brush. Get the inside all cleaned up and get all this crud that's built up and rocks and whatever out of here and probably do the other front one too. And hopefully when I'm all done, this is gonna be like a brand new wheel and tire going on and it's gonna feel even better going down the road. There you go. They came out pretty good. They're not perfect by any means, but they're much, much better. So I'll pull the other one off the car real quick while I'm doing this. So the other side is just as clean and ready to roll. And we'll get the car back down on the ground, put the interior together and go for a little ride. All right, so here's a quick view of the other wheel. I got the driver's side all taken apart. And what I'm gonna do is go clean it real quick. I'll do that off camera and I'll show you guys what it'll look like when I'm all done. All right, this one's all cleaned up. Didn't come out quite as good as the other one, but what I did notice is that the two wheels appear to be made different. So I don't know, maybe one of you guys can comment. One of these appears to be factory and one of these may be an aftermarket wheel. I'll try and find a little freeze frame of the other wheel, but it looked like the center on the other wheel was welded all the way around here. And this is a fully cast wheel. So 
If you guys know the difference, they both have this Japan casting in here. The, the passenger side wheel had different castings throughout this area on the uh, mesh of the wheel. This is all on the hub area. So the two fronts appear to be different, but they're both fronts. So I can't imagine that GM manufactured or whoever manufactured the wheels, if they're a speed line or whatever, they manufactured them different on the passengers and driver's side because they're not directional or anything, but the wheels do appear to be made different. So one of these may be a reproduction, and it might be the other side because I noticed a GM authentic reproduction part or a licensed part. So the other center cap is actually a reproduction is what I noticed, but I don't know whether or not this one is. Maybe the sticker's just gone. I mean, it looks the same as the other one. So I honestly don't know the difference. I haven't had more than a couple of these cars with these wheels and I've never really looked at them that close. So if you guys have any info on that and you can tell me which one is factory and which is reproduction, that'd be good to know. Drop a comment down below. All right, so the front of the car is all together. The wheels are looking really good. Oh, I cleaned them up a little bit. And I don't remember if I showed you guys or not what I ended up doing with the relay situation, but this, like I said, this is the factory power antenna relay. The leads that were cut off are here. So I've got my little butt splices hidden in there. And what I'm gonna do is put the lower dash back together and that lower kick panel. And I'm gonna take the car off for a ride. So I'll get this thrown back together and I'll see you guys on the road.